So as I mentioned, we are live from Rick Real Dairy in Rick Real, Oregon. And on your screen right now, you see Farmer Louis. Louis is the owner and manager of Rick Real Dairy. And he's going to be leading us through a presentation today, really just sharing a little bit about his farm. And we'll also have an opportunity to be joined by an OSU extension agent um, at, in a few moments. So again, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over now to Louis to give us our tour. Well, hey guys, uh, I am honored and thrilled that you guys would take time out of your day and, and come visit with us here today at Rick Real Dairy. My name is Louis. Um, a lot of people call me Farmer Louie, and um, with me behind the camera is my son, Nate, and my daughter, Stacy. and I just want to thank Ag and the class for including us in this opportunity to talk to you guys about what happens at a typical dairy all over the, all over the country, and especially here in Oregon. Uh, we moved here 30 years ago from California. Uh, just like most people in Oregon have come from another area, but um, don't hold that against us. Uh, we have raised our family. I have four children and three phenomenal son-in-laws and seven and a half grandkids. And so we have done, uh, been blessed way beyond what we need uh, here at, at Rick Real Dairy. Uh, we employ 25 full-time staff. Uh, and some of my employees have been with me for 30 years. And so uh, we try to treat everybody like family. And um, as, we, as we take care of the, as you'll know today in the calf barn, we take care of our calves the, in, in the best way possible. Uh, and we do the same thing with our dairy, and our full-size dairy animals and milk production and with these animals as they are growing up. Uh, we milk right at 1,700 cows three times a day. It takes us seven hours and 45 minutes to milk all 1,700 animals. We shut down for 15 minutes, wash the system, and start right back up again. So for 30 years, our milking barn, where, where all the activity is happening to, to get the milk out of the cows, has, the lights have never been turned off. Uh, we go 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There are three milkers here all the time. We don't always have a full staff here because we only feed and stuff during the day, but we have 25 employees. We produce 15, uh, roughly 15,000 gallons of milk a day. Break that down to pounds or gallons per cow. And it's, it's roughly 10 and a half to 11 gallons of milk per cow. The milk that comes out of our cows is about 3.9% butterfat. So you buy your milk by whole milk, which is three and a half percent, low fat, 2%, 1%, and then non-fat. So what they do at the grocery stores before it gets to you guys is they skim the cream off the top, the best part. They take that off the top and then they make the ice cream and the butter out of that and they sell the leftovers to us as consumers. So all of our milk right now goes to Umqua Dairy. We belong to Dairy Gold. Uh, Dairy Gold then decides where our milk is gonna be shipped to. And right now all of our product is being made into Umqua Dairy products. And we're pretty proud of that. So if you want to, if you want to, uh, to enjoy a good dairy product, look in a grocery store for Umqua milk Umqua ice cream, and that's going to be a big portion of, that's where our milk all goes with a few other dairies in Oregon. So in our calf barn, uh, we built this barn two years ago. And when we, when we normally were raising our calves, every one of the calves behind me would be in an individual hutch. And we believe that these calves, it was more healthy for them to be completely isolated from each other. So no bacteria could spread from one to another. So there'd be no, no uh, if the theory was, if one got sick, it couldn't spread the disease. We all know about COVID and how that spreads. We know how, well, I'm not gonna go there. Um, <laughs> we had the theory that if we isolated every single cow or calf, for the first 
eight to 10 weeks of its life, it wouldn't make any other calf sick. We now know that's false. Okay, so when we were looking into building a new calf barn, we wanted to do um, what was sustainable and, and what, was, what was correct. And how did God create our, our animals and create them? They didn't, he didn't create them to be alone. They are a herd animal. They like to be together. Here we were for the first 10 weeks of their life, traumatizing them by keeping them individual. And we didn't even realize it until we started putting them in here two years ago and we got to watch them run and kick. And after they've had their bottle of milk and develop muscles that they couldn't develop in their individual hushes. And we are now making a, a stronger, better calf heifer for our future herd. These animals that were born here, these are a, a month old. In 21 months, they'll be full size mature animals. They will have a calf and then they will become a milking cow in our herd. Our goal is to make the next generation better than this generation. And in order to do that right now, it has to do with um, cow care, calf care, calf comfort, calf nutrition. And in this barn, we've got the best of all worlds because in each calf, you can see the ear tag. Attached to the ear tag is an RFID, which is an electronic transmitter. Maybe we can zoom in or come closer to a calf over here. The calf in their left ear, which would be your right, of 1861, there's a whole bunch of numbers there. That corresponds to the RFID tag that is in their ear. Now, we never have to look at that small number. We only worry about the 4861 number. That's her number for the rest of her life. When she gets thirsty and decides that she wants some milk and the computer senses that it's okay for her to have some milk, the calf will then come into this chute right here. This tag, the tag on their left ear gets read by the computer. And here, com here comes one. And let's see once what this calf is gonna, oh, we've got a, a fast blinking green light coming from the computer that said, sorry calf, you've already drank your allotment of milk today. You've gotta wait another couple hours before you can have milk. They can come in here and drink four to six to eight times a day if, if they so desire. And the computer keeps track of how much they drank each time. They keep track of how fast they drank, how many times they let go of the nipple. If they're, and that tells us how fast they drink, tells us it's an early stage of, of uh, sometimes we get pneumonia and it'll cause them to cough. And so there's a lot of different touch point technology that, that we use in this feeding system. So how does it work? We, we have powder milk in here and my employees just left. And so this is nice and full. Now this is, this is not your typical powder milk that you use in cooking. Um, it's not human powder milk. This is a 20% fat 20% protein mix. So it's, it's very, very concentrated milk. So we have the powder milk here. The calf comes in, the computer senses that the computer, that she deserves to get some milk. The powder milk falls out the bottom of this cone and lands in this blender. The water comes out of here at 106 degrees because it's, it's got a calf temperature is 102. So this is 106 to dissolve the butter fat that's in the powder milk. It blends this up, adds a little touch of vitamins, and then it goes over through a tube over to where the calf is ready to drink. Question. 
Yeah, quick question about um, why do you make the calves wait to drink the milk? Great question, because these calves right here are now getting uh, eight liters of milk in a 24 hour period. If we allowed them, they would drink all eight liters in the first half hour of the day. And they would, they literally would drink until they could not hold any more. And then they would be hungry the rest of the day. And so what we do is we take, the computer takes the amount of milk that they're allowed and divides it up evenly into groups of a liter or a liter and a half to two liters at a time, depending on how big they are. So what that allows us to do, and that's a great question because when the calf comes in here and it's a week old, we start them on four liters of milk. And so they stay on four liters of milk for the first two or three days they're here. Then the, sec the, the third or fourth day, it goes to four and a half liters, then five liters, five and a half liters. And I'll show you the computer program here in just a minute, but it ramps up to the, to the eight liter mark. And then for 40 days, we leave them at the eight meter mark. And then we start ramping them down so that when they leave this area here, and go to our other group housing for them, they're, they're fully conditioned to live without mama's milk. And they, they don't go hungry. Uh, they, if we just cut them off from the, from the milk, they're so used to that. They just stand around and beller looking for food. And we used to think that was normal. That's not normal. Um, calf, a hungry calf is not normal. Uh, so that's the reason we don't dump them, dump that amount of milk in front of them at one time. I, that's a great question. So are there any other questions as we're going through this? Don't hesitate to send in your, your questions and uh, I will answer them as they come in. Yeah, so one other question, just clarifying the temperature of the milk when it's fed to the calves. Is that, did you say 106 degrees Fahrenheit or Celsius? No, that's Fahrenheit. We Fahrenheit. Um, I don't. These are German machines, and so they go by liter. Uh, I try to break it down to American standards uh, whenever we can. And so, the a normal calf temperature and cow temperature is between 101 and 102. So when we see a sick animal and we take its temperature, 102 is not alarming at all for us and for them. Uh, if it was a human, you know, we all know 102 is, is bad news. You've, you've got something going on in your system. 102 is normal for these guys. So in order to break the powder milk down and dissolve the fat that's in there, it has to go to 100, between 106 and 108 degrees for like 10 seconds in order to dissolve the, the butter fat. If, it, if the butter fat's not dissolved, it literally will go right through the calf. They'll get no nutritional value out of it at all. So the temperature of this water that mixes with the powder milk is so important that every, every liter that gets mixed, the temperature is checked and recorded for each one. And we'll get a warning light if the temperature uh, is either too high or too low. And so the temperature, that whole mixing unit that I showed you guys, and I wish we had some, this is just the wrong time of day. They are all done drinking and they won't, they won't get up to drink again until about 10, 30, 11 o'clock. They'll all come in one at a time. They'll slowly mosey in and drink. Then they'll go down, lay down. And then at one o'clock it opens back up again and they know it and they all start coming back in again. And, and so they kind of get used to the routine as to when they can come in and when they can't come in. Um, the cab I showed you that walked in would never have come in there if I hadn't been standing there uh, to, to even check to see if she could get more milk. She just, she knows instinctively and, and through, uh, through habit that there's not anything available to them. So let's walk over to the computer. And if you have more questions, Jessica, go ahead and just keep talking as we move over here. Yeah, so related to the computer, are the computer chips built into their RFID tags? Dogs and cats yes. have chips under the skin, so it's a little different than that. Yes, but it's very similar uh, to that. That little chip that in your dog and your cat is a very, very similar chip to what's inside 
the ear tag here of number 4879. So yeah, that is the exact same type of idea that we that we use um, for each individual calf. And as these calves, uh, we use it in our adult cows too, because in the milking parlor, we check how much milk they give every time they come in the parlor. And so these RFID tags are how we manage the dairy every single day. They are a huge part of the technology that we use to transfer the technology from the cow to the, to, to the computer. Oh, and we have, we have, I don't have my phone with me right now because it rings off the hook, but um, we have an app on our phone that we can look up any cow from any place in the dairy and we have exactly how much milk they produced. We can look up one of these calves on that app and it will tell us from here exactly how much, if they've been sick, what we've treated them with, how many times we've treated them, and uh, so on and so forth. My son just pulled up a number. Oh, here we go. Here's 4876. Now, I don't, I don't know if you, can, if you can see this. I'm hoping you can. I got to come closer, he's saying. Come closer. Clo what? Right there. Okay, so on 10-6, on October 6, 4876, had cab scours. She was born on 927. The CE1 means that it was a perfectly normal birth, no stress involved to the calf. Okay, so let's go to a. Here, it, this is their birth date, her age and months, 1.7. Um, if this were a cow, it would tell us exactly um, how much milk she was giving and, and so on. Uh, let's go to another number. How do you just go to the next number? I want to find one with a little more health. So, no. Okay, so that is the herd. The, the, we, we keep two different programs. There's a program to run these, the feeding software. Um, and then we convert that information into a program that we have called uh, it's D Dairy Herd Improvement um, Software. And it's, it's a company out of Provo, Utah that does software just for dairy cows and, and dairymen to manage. And so, uh, and everything is managed through that program. The feed, the computer program that, that I wanna take a few minutes to show you, and I think I've got five minutes left. So let's pick a number again. Um, how about, we'll just stay with 4876. And so, I love watching them run around like that. So uh, on this computer, all, all the different feeding, calf feeding areas, here's feeder one, feeder two. So we're on feeder number six, calf number 4876. And in the, you can see here, we started her at four liters of milk. This is the graph that we want them to follow. The blue line is what they actually drank. And then all the little dots on the top indicate a different problem, whether, whether they, they drank very slowly or not. Now you can see that this particular calf actually started a little slow. She could have had more milk here, but she didn't, she didn't want it. Uh, so we need to know, we, we look at her and figure out why, did not, why didn't she want it. But now here at the eight and a half liter mark, there, she's pretty, pretty solid all the way across. And she'll stay this way until day 60. And then we start to ramp them down. And at day 70, they're all finished with their milk and, and they leave this barn and, and we make room for another, another one. Uh, another set of animals. And so we have this on every single animal uh, that's in this barn. Then we can run reports and we know exactly how much powder milk and, and grain it took to raise that calf for the first 70 to 90 days of its life. And we can, we can calculate then how much did it cost us 
per pound of weight gain, because that's what we're after. We're after these calves to grow muscle, grow bone, and become a stronger animal for us when they begin milking. And so our feed costs per pound have gone up, but we know that when they begin to milk, their production will also be higher. And so uh, we are just now getting into the calves that were born and went through our calf barn here uh, as far as milk production, because that takes two years to do. So we've been in this barn for two years. We're just beginning to get the data. So uh, when we had them in individual hutches, for instance, they would go in at birth, they would come out at 70 days. We would weigh them in groups of five. We were happy at 70 days of age to have a 160 pound calf that we thought was pretty good. At 70 days of age coming out of this barn, they're 205 pounds. We've picked up 45 pounds in 70 days by the way we're feeding here. Now that's not body fat, that's bone and muscle that we're developing. And the first 60 days of a calf's life is the most important time. So I have one minute left. And so are we have to, we're gonna move into an adult cow barn and, and Jennifer is gonna take over, but real quick before we leave this barn, are there, are there more questions? Yeah, a question, um, Brooklyn wants to know, has there ever been a cow that hasn't been recorded? Uh, I'm sure that has happened. Um, if the calf comes into the into the milking area and the ear tag has is missing or it falls off, it still gets fed a minimum amount of milk and it's flagged red. So we know immediately when there's a calf without an ear tag. And so that takes away the risk of a, of a calf losing an ear tag or an RFID tag all of a sudden not working that animal will not starve. They're gonna go in and get fed. Uh, and, and depending on what pen they're in, they'll get very close to the amount that they're supposed to. It's just a big red line on the computer screen that says, we got a problem with this calf. You gotta go figure that out. Uh, we get that um, regularly with the milk cows where, where we have a sensor that goes bad and, and it's not responding. Um, if they're enrolled into the computer at birth, um, do we miss one once in a while? We do, but as soon as somebody either makes a, a corral change or a, a, uh, a health entry into that, into that health or that calf, and it's not there, we, we can go fix it. So it's not gonna go more than a week without being identified in the computer. Good question, Brittany. And um, where are the calves born? And also what do you do with the bull calves? Good questions. The calves are born on the dairy um, on the other side of the farm. Uh, we, have a, we have what we call a maternity pen where five to 10 calves are born every 24 hours. Okay, somebody walks through that pen every hour on the hour to check how the moms are doing and how birth is coming along. We don't assist every single calf. There are a lot of calves that are born that we go out in an hour, in an hour, we see that the mother is laying pushing and the next hour the calf is there. We have to assist probably 20% and of those 20%, there's probably another 15% that we really have to help them along and, and help the calf get born. So we watch closely, they're born in another area. We get right now with, um, the way we're doing our breeding, we're getting about 60% heifers and 40% bull calves born. And the bull calves are picked up every morning and they go to a, a, a depot center and actually they end up in Fresno, California uh, to a big feedlot there that has contracts with some of the, the big uh, fast food restaurants. Uh, it's all turned into beef nobody, uh, nothing gets wasted, okay? Anything else? The other questions, oh, a, a question about what happens if one of the calves escapes the pens? Oh, good question too. If she escapes the pens and actually 
uh, they can't leave this barn. The barn's completely enclosed. And so they, they go into the feed alley where we were, where we were filming just a few minutes ago. But um, we don't like them to get out of the pens because they get tangled up in the hoses and all kinds of different things. They can't do any harm to themselves or anything. They just kind of make a mess. And so because it's never just one calf that gets out, it's usually a whole pen. So you've got 20, 15 to 20 calves out here running around all night long and they, they, they knock over stuff and it's just not, they won't get hurt, but uh, we don't like it. <laughs> They're nosy. So we're gonna, we're going to move over to another barn. And while we are walking, I'm gonna be muted. And uh, Jennifer Cruikshank is going to give you an overview of the dairy industry. And then I'll catch up with you guys in about five minutes. Okay, we'll see you soon. Wonderful, so it's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Jennifer Cruikshank. And Dr. Cruikshank is a um, OSU extension agent that's in charge of um, dairy management. So she works with farmers like Louie. So Dr. Cruikshank. All right. Good morning, everyone. So um, I want to share with you just sort of a little bit of an overview of um, what dairy farming looks like in this state. And you're getting a really good um, glimpse of that at um, Rick Real Dairy, who's a great example. Um, but it's one example. So we've got a lot of diversity in the state. Um, we've got somewhere around 200 dairy farms. And most of those are cow dairies, um, as you might expect, but we've also got some goat dairies and there's even one um, commercial scale sheep dairy down on the Southern coast um, that's bottling milk. Um, so, and in that diversity, we've got everything from really small farms that are bottling their own milk and selling directly at farmer's markets and at local grocery stores um, up to the scale of Rick Real Dairy. Uh, um, which is supplying um, one of our major bottlers in the state, that, and that being Umpqua. Um, other milk from other farms goes to Darigold, it goes to Tillamook, um, it goes to Organic Valley, um, to Eberhards, which is over in Central Oregon, um, to Larson's Creamery, which is in Portland, they make a lot of butter, um, Nancy's Yogurt down in Eugene, um, they take in a lot of milk, um, and there's other processors that, that even more processors than that. Um, along with the smaller ones that are bottling their own milk um, and making cheese, you know, from as few as, as six cows, you know, on up to um, our, our several thousand cow dairies. Um, about, um, and so in total, um, Oregon has about 124,000 milking cows. Um, and again, those are dispersed um, all over the state. Um, and a lot of that milk stays um, here where we consume it, but we don't actually have enough people in Oregon to consume the milk from 124,000 cows. So some of that, um, some of those, that milk is, is made into other products and that's um, uh, exported out of state. So it may, um, you can find Tillamook cheese, for example, in grocery stores all over the country. Um, and some of that milk product is actually exported overseas, um, particularly to Asia, um, to Japan, China. Um, they're a really big export milk uh, export market for um, for the milk that's produced in in the Pacific Northwest in general. Um, so both Oregon, Washington, and Idaho, and a lot of that leaves is dry product, um, so powdered milk in various forms. Um, about 25% of our farms in Oregon are organic, and that's a lot higher than the national average. National average is around 8%, so we're at about three times that. Um, you've seen some really interesting technology at Rick Real Dairy um, in the calf pens um, with the automatic feeders, and that is great because calves can kind of feed themselves, um, uh, which gives them a lot more flexibility and kind of control over over their, um, their timing on their intake. Um, uh, on other dairies, we've got milking robots, which operate um, largely the same way, but for adult cows. Um, so they choose um, the exact timing of when they, then when they are milked. Um, so, and those um, types of technologies are, are on the increase. So we're increasingly seeing those on dairies um, because they're, they're good for cow uh, welfare and, um, and uh, they make sense actually to um, the physiology of the cow and they're really good for production. The other nice thing about these technologies, um, as Louie was talking about, is it allows for lots of data collection. And the more data you have, and 
assuming that you use the data, that allows you to um, really get a good comprehensive picture of what's going on with, with your cows as a whole, as the whole herd, but also each individual cow. Um, so it's easier to identify um, where there may be some health problem where she needs a little extra attention um, and who your high producers are and who your low producers are. And that helps you make decisions about who should reproduce and who should um, you know, create the daughters that are gonna continue your herd on into the future. Um, cows have become a lot more efficient um, in Oregon and the US as a whole. Um, so in 1950, the US had 22 million cows in the whole country. Um, and, and now today, we only have 9 million cows. So less than half the number of cows that we had in 1950. Um, but those cows, 79% more milk than those 22 million cows that were um, populating dairy farms in 1950. Um, and that's a really impressive increase. And that's coming from improvements in genetics. So we have a much better understanding of the genetics of dairy cows and how to make selection decisions. Um, and we make use of genomics, if you're familiar with that term. Um, so understanding a lot better, like which genes are influencing which traits. Um, so we've got huge improvements in genetics over those decades, and we've also got improvements in management. So having a better understanding of how we should feed cows, how we should house cows, um, how we should um, monitor and um, address health issues. So it looks like we're maybe moved over to the freestall barn. Louis, are you ready over there? We're standing in the sun. Perfect. I'm going to back up just a little bit so it's not in my eyes. Jennifer, thank you for that overview. Uh, I didn't even realize we had sheep dairies uh, in Oregon. <laughs> so uh, I get so tunnel vision with our industry that I don't even realize what's going on uh, with the goat dairies and everything else. So thank you for that. That was, that was really good. We have now moved over uh, to one of our five barns that hold our milking cows okay so if you look down the alley here i don't know how well you can see it but you can get an idea for the length of this barn there are five there's 480 animals in each barn there are five barns okay now we don't have them all full we don't want them full uh because of because of the um social needs that that cows have overcrowding creates an animal that gets pushed out. So we don't like to overcrowd our cows. We put them in groups of 92 or 115. And that's simply because that's what goes through our milking parlor. 115 is about 10 cows over for crowding. 92 to 100 is where we have a bed for each cow and a place for them to eat. Herd health is the name of the game for anybody in the dairy business or in an animal egg. If you don't have a healthy animal, you're not going to be successful. How do you make a healthy animal or how do you keep an animal healthy? Here at Rick Real Dairy, we watch two things, nutrition, cow comfort, and cow comfort. I can't think of the third one, <laughs> I just drew a blank. But if you don't have nutrition, your cows are gonna be skinny and eventually they develop a foot problem. If you don't have cow comfort, if these cows don't have a comfortable bed to go lay down in and produce the milk and chew their cud, you're gonna have eventually unhealthy animals. You want them to be able to lay down whenever they want to. So we keep water in front of them. Each cow drinks between 35 and 60 gallons of water a day. Okay, when it's hot, they drink more. When it's cold, they drink a little bit less. But you gotta remember, each cow is giving 11 gallons of milk. Of that 11 gallons, a full 10 and a half gallons of that is just water. The other solids that make up the milk part are very small in comparison. So these are, a, these are a milk making machine. And the closer that we can feed them 
nutritionally to the production that they are giving, the healthier the animal will be. Obviously, the more milk they give, and we have animals that give upwards of uh, 20 gallons to 30 gallons a day. And so they, they're obviously drinking more, they're eating more, they're, their needs are higher. And so our key is we keep this feed in front of them 24 hours a day. <clears throat> so this is what we call a complete mix, a complete ration. Uh, it's got some corn silage in it. That's what this is right here. Obviously, it's got some alfalfa in it. It's got some grass silage and clover silage that's, that we grow locally here. Then it's also got embedded into it is grain, a special custom mix that we do here um, that gives us the exact protein and the exact energy that each animal needs. My goal is every bite that the cow takes, no matter what time of the day, is the same. They always get the same. There's no sorting, there's no, there's no mixing. We have a nutritionist. <clears throat> yes, <clears throat> there are cow nutritionists that travel around and visit dairies. And I have a nutritionist on staff, on retainer. And, and um, excuse me, I got equipment running behind me. I'm distracted a little bit. But the nutritionist comes every two weeks and they walk through the animals with, with Nate or my other herdsmen that are here. And they look for skinny cows. They look for cows that might have diarrhea. They might, they might look for cows that are constipated. They're looking for all of these different things, signs that the ration isn't correct. We, we don't like to change our ration. We change it very slowly and very little at a time if we ever have to. So nutrition is a, is a key. And I could go into a whole new webinar just with the nutrition that we, that we use. I can do another whole webinar just on vaccines and what we do to prevent the animals from getting sick. I can go on a whole new webinar just on our breeding program and how we do that. And then you've got the farming operation and our soil health and our sustainability stuff and, and all of the rest. So understand students, this is a 30,000 foot view of our little farm and how we manage it. And we're just scratching the surface. As high school students, I want to encourage you that there is more to farming than a farmer. There are a lot of people behind the scenes doing a lot of work for the ag industry. This industry is not dying. It is moving forward. We need students to, to get the education and stick with ag and help us behind the scenes do a better job than we're doing today. So I'm gonna take open it up for questions to you guys and we're just gonna stand right here uh, and, and I'm gonna take questions and Jennifer is gonna take some questions. So I'm hoping you guys learned a little bit today and also have a, just like I said, the 30,000 foot view of what happens here at a farm. So one of the questions that a few people have had is, do the cows go out on pasture? Good question. Our cows do not go out on pasture. Uh, for the Willamette Valley, today it's a very wet day. If we had to let our animals out to pasture, they would be walking through mud and muck and getting wet and cold. We would prefer that they stay right here. We actually put pedometers on the cows, like Fitbit, to measure how much the cows are actually getting for exercise. And we monitor that. We don't do it on every single cow, but we do monitor it. They're getting above and beyond the recommended exercise for a Holstein, just coming from this pen, walking all the way up to the milking parlor and back three times a day. So they're getting exercise. They're getting they're, they're walking and they're moving around and using their muscles. Um, we just don't put them out on pasture. We're more successful bringing the pasture to them via the silage 
that's in this feed. Uh, what is what happens if cows do get ill? What is your protocol, and also how do you test cows for diseases? Very good. Um, every morning, these these animals are what we call locked up for our herdsmen, and you can see that this this pivots. Okay, when a cow comes in and eats, their neck goes down, and this pivots. Well, this this turns and it will get stuck right here, making the cow locked up. She can't move. So we lock up the entire herd for about a half an hour every morning. I have three herdsmen that walk behind them checking for heat detection, checking them for any health issues that they might see. Um, so we do that, hands on, eyes on. We get reports coming out of the milking barn that if a cow gave, just for instance, 80 pounds today and, and um, she was supposed to give 100 pounds, the computer will flag that number. We make a, a short list of animals that are what we call off milk. And some of them, we can't find anything wrong, but we go, we take the list every morning and we find when the cows are locked up, we find those animals whose production is, is a certain percentage lower than it was the day before. We physically look at that animal. The third way that we monitor the health of our animals is in the milking parlor. Our milkers are part of their job is not only to prep the teats and hang the machines, their job is to look for mastitis, which is one of our biggest concerns here at the farm. Mastitis is, is the number one, my number one financial loser on a dairy. Um, and in order to fight mastitis, you need healthy, you need a, a very comfortable place for them to lay down that's clean. And so everything has to, has to work together like this, but we have a lot of touch points every day where our employees go out and make sure that our animals are staying healthy once they are healthy. Um, a Excuse couple me. of people, Taylor and a few others wanna know, why um, you have Holsteins and not other breeds of jerry cows? A good question. Um, you, we do have some, some breeded animals is what we call them different um, that are not Holsteins. The problem with mixing a Holstein with say a Jersey in the same pen is a Holstein weighs roughly 1200 pounds. Uh, they can go up to 1,600 pounds. When you've got a jersey next to it that weighs between 850 and 1,100 pounds, the jersey doesn't stand a chance. They get beat up. They get picked on. Uh, they get bullied around. And so we have to choose a breed of animals that is comparable to the Holstein. And so we've done, we've done some breed um, testing with using the larger different breeds like the Swiss, uh, Red Holsteins, uh, Guernseys, those all stay pretty good. Holstein makes great milk for putting in a milk jug. Jerseys and the other breeds make great milk for cheese and other products. And so it just depends on what you're going to use your milk for. All our milk is going to Amqua, and the grand majority of it is going into the gallon jugs um, with the different butter fats and being, being utilized that way. If I was shipping to Tillamook and all my milk was being used for, for cheese, I would probably have to switch from Holstein to Jersey just so that they can make a better cheese with it. So that's just kind of the, the reasoning. You'll see either Jerseys or Holsteins across, uh, across Oregon and at different farms. It just depends on what they're doing with the milk. So we are almost out of time for today, but there is a good question that was asked at the beginning I want to get to, which is just how has the pandemic affected your cows or your farm um, and what precautions are you taking? Um, unfortunately, you know, we're all walking through this pandemic together. And, you know, when, it, when we started with this back in April, uh, you know, we all had to learn a new way of life. And it was the same here at the dairy. The cows are perfectly safe. 
we don't transmit our diseases to cows and cows do not transmit their diseases to humans. And so there's no chance of us catching COVID, giving it to the animals, they're safe. They have an autoimmune system that's completely different than ours. For my employees, it's been hard um, as it is for any other, any other business in Oregon right now. Um, the milk price has, has plummeted for us because of the export that's not happening right now. And so um, all of our milk is, is in the country and in Oregon is pulled together and utilized. And so it's priced accordingly. And right now we are in a, in a like the rest of the country, we're in a depressed price structure. So that's added pressure on, on myself and, and, and managers and just to pay all the bills. But we've taken every precaution. Our, our, our men are all supplied with their with the face masks. Um, we've had we've had one COVID scare with an employee that that did catch COVID. Um, none of our that was about a month ago. None of our other employees um, got it. Thank goodness, because as you know, if you're exposed, you've got to go home and wait this thing out. Well, we tested everybody. They were all negative. Um, I can't milk these cows myself. And so it, it, be, it's, it was a real panic when I found out one of my workers had it because I need all 25 employees. They all play a vital role in, in managing the, the dairy. And so uh, it's, it's not like a, a, a restaurant where you can just close the doors. We have to do this 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we've taken a lot of precautions and um, so far it, it has worked out okay. But good question, good question. Wonderful. Well, we actually have two more questions. It looks okay. like they're slowing down. If, if anybody does need to leave, we understand. But if you're okay, Louie, we'll just go ahead and answer these last two questions. Sure. One of them That's is, great. why why do you separate the calves and the cows when they're born? Okay. That's And, and that, again, is, is a very legitimate, honest question. Why don't we leave the calves with mom, okay, like they do with the beef herds? You see the beef herds outside a calf standing next to the mother. Um, for one, we're, we use Holsteins to produce milk for us, not their calf. Two, Holstein breed has horrible motherhood instincts. They do a very poor job of naturally taking care of their baby. Even in the first 24 hours that they can be together, the mom is kind of aloof to their, to their babies. Very few do a good job. So we feel like um, with the Holstein breed, especially, we have to step in to keep our losses down, especially in the first couple hours. A calf has to have its colostrum within two hours of birth, which means it has to be dried, stood, get up on its own, and then go find the teat from mom and drink a gallon and a half of colostrum within two hours. Most Holsteins won't let their animals nurse. Oh, we've got some employees that are trying to get through here, so we're going to walk around the corner. So the did, last that question, your, oh. did that answer the question, Jessica? I think it did, thank you. Okay. Um, and then the last question is, what happens when one of the cows does not milk or does not produce milk? Okay, so we have a, a, a natural, what we call a turnover in our dairy herd, which is about 30% of the herd. Every year, their production will drop to a level that's not sustainable for us. Right now, our, our, my cutoff, my break even for feed and, and animal care is about, is about 55 to 60 pounds. Okay, behind me, you can see a couple employees have just come into the picture. They're putting out salt, which is an important ingredient for every calf. And so once a week, we go through, we add salt blocks and, and salt bags for the cows to eat. All of that to try to cut down on our turnover rate. And so uh, they end up for beef. They go to a beef, uh, an auction yard, and most Holstein dairy animals end up for hamburger because they're so lean. There's not any fat. They're generally too old to make steaks. And so, but they make 
phenomenal hamburgers and at Taco Bell and Burger King and Carl's Jr. That's generally where the Holstein animals end up. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Farmer Louie and Dr. Crookshank, for joining us today. I know that there was lots of um, engagement in our questions. So thank you all students for joining us and taking time to do that. Um, and I hope you enjoy some dairy products today. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Have a good day. Take care from Rick Real Dairy. Bye-bye.